Like it or not, Chinese motorcycles are coming into Western markets, which is what happens when the established companies do not give consumers what they've been asking for. Meanwhile, CF Moto is bringing all kinds of models to the market, like the Ibex 450 Adventure Bike, a twin-cylinder motorcycle that should be considerably lighter than a Tenere 700. Additionally, their 450 CLC seems to be set to challenge the Kawasaki Eliminator and Honda Rebel 500 in the small cruiser segment. The Shinrei built SWM Storebreaker 1200, basically a clone of the 1200cc Evo Sportster, is the only game in town when it comes to an affordable new Harley type motorcycle. Speaking of Harley, they have struck a deal with Chinese QJ Motors to build two models for the Asian market. The same QJ Motors which builds the newly revived Benelli. And Kovei is another manufacturer that has finally brought a lightweight Dakar style rally bike to the masses at an affordable price. Can you name an established Western or Japanese manufacturer that has done that? Neither can I. Oh, and don't even get me started on the Suron scene. If there's one company that has managed to capture the imagination of young riders and started a trendy movement, it is this Chinese company along with their competitor Telaria. So in this video, I want to examine the effects of the Chinese invasion of the Western motorcycle market. Will these brands be a major player in Western markets and how will the incumbents respond? Stay tuned and if you're finding this channel valuable, please support it by subscribing, liking the video and sharing it with friends. China's economy is in the toilet right now, their entire stock market is worth less than Nvidia and their real estate bubble has burst with some of their biggest developers going bust. That country is staring down the barrel of a great depression. However, China's motorcycle industry is not following the same trajectory, and I would argue that this is because it's changed its approach to building products. China used to use the brute force method, produce very cheap goods at scale and bring them to market at rock bottom prices. And the problem with that approach is that it does not stress quality or innovation. Let's face it, Chinese vehicles and motorcycles in particular do not have a great reputation for quality and reliability. In a Fortnite video, Chinese motorcycle brands had by far the highest amounts of particulate in their oil after the first oil change. The dirty oil definitely betrays some quality control issues. I'll buy a $5 Chinese made t-shirt at Walmart without a second thought, because if it falls apart I'm only out 5 bucks, but a motor vehicle is another matter. Not only is it a reliability concern when the manufacturing is shoddy, it's also a safety concern. This is what I'd like to call the Soviet Russia approach from the 60s. You see, the Russians had captured many German BMW motorcycles during World War II and reverse engineered and started producing them under the name Cossack. A poignant anecdote was presented by historian Steve Keen on the Lex Friedman podcast about the Soviet production philosophy. Oh, no, my first major girlfriend uh, had a <laughs> brother who yes. wanted to get a motorbike but he mm -hmm. couldn't afford a Honda or a Kawasaki. At the time, they cost about $3,000 for a 650cc Japanese motorbike. He found he could buy a Cossack mm -hmm. for $650, $1 per cc. So I was there $1 when they got... Per this, this, yeah, like this, it. This, this is in, this is in suburban Sylvania waters in, a, in Sydney. Mm -hmm. So this crate arrives with a Cossack motorbike inside it. So we take it apart. It's then got all these wooden palings. We have to pull off the wooden palings to open it up. Then there's oil-soaked rag over this thing, which is tied on a, on a wooden base. Yeah. We take the oil-soaked rag off and we stare in all its glory in a 1942 BMW. Yeah. Okay. It was exactly the same as Steve McQueen and yeah. Great Escape. So the Russians for 30 years were making the same bloody motorbike. It had a bicycle seat. Yeah. Okay. And this is what that's how they cope. They've just made the same damn machine every year. And he said, so that's that's the outcome. You you actually want the best possible world. You're trying to build as fast as possible. You're paying workers as high wages as you possibly can. And the, that leads to a world where you don't innovate. But he said, capitalism, on the other hand, pure capitalist economy, you're trying to pay workers as little as possible. You have competitive industries, you're trying to take demand away from your rivals. You have Kawasaki versus Honda versus you know, um, uh, BMW, et cetera, et cetera. The way you get demand away from your competitors is by innovating. Mm -hmm. So what you will get is cycles and booms and slumps, but you will innovate and change over time. 
So what you found was this huge gap between socialist volume production with no innovation and capitalism with innovation. Now, Cossack survives today as Ural, but it never made significant inroads into the Western market. You see, Western consumers prefer innovation and quality to rock bottom prices, and that is why Chinese motor vehicles have not significantly caught on here. However, there is another way of doing business that companies like Kove, CF Moto, and Suron have adopted, and this is far more likely to bring them success in the West. This model has been used by companies in the East before, and very successfully I might add. Because believe it or not, when I first got to Canada in 1984, Japanese cars were looked down upon and referred to as pieces of junk. Old school Civics were derided and thought inferior to good old American cars. But gas had gotten expensive, and Japanese brands like Honda were simply giving consumers what they were asking for. A cheap, reliable and economical vehicle. Within a decade, by the time I was approaching my 20s, the Honda Civic and CRX were the most popular models for young guys in my age group who bought and modified them to be great little sports cars. Those guys in turn might have bought more Hondas and Toyotas when they got into their 30s and might still be driving Japanese today. You see, our age group had broken the stigma of Japanese cars being junk, and it was all because companies like Honda had given us cool products we could get excited about. As a result, the old prejudices were forgotten, and Japanese cars became some of the most desirable machines on the market. This strategy was repeated by Korean brands like Hyundai and Kia in the 90s and early 2000s, and again those brands went from being derided and looked down upon to being fully accepted by Westerners. So how do the Chinese motorcycle manufacturers achieve similar adoption? First, by being as fanatical about quality control as the Japanese brands. Nobody wants an unreliable motorcycle. Can they achieve it? Royal Enfield did in the last decade. This Indian company used to have questionable reliability. A peg fell off the old Himalayan in a promo and they left a shot in the video. But now, remember the Fort 9 oil test? Royal Enfield had the cleanest oil. Their new factories are serious about quality control and Royal Enfield is taking the world by storm with a bunch of new models aimed at young customers which make the brand look cool and in demand. So, that Chinese oil has to get cleaner. Fortunately for these companies, they seem to be cleaning up their quality control issues. I myself tested two Surons on this channel this past summer, flogged them over tough terrain and rode them through deep mud and water and never a hiccup. Check out those videos in the top right corner. Generally, Surons have a great reputation for reliability. They've been around for a while and you don't hear about too many mechanicals. Not much can go wrong with electric bikes. And speaking of Suron, this is a company that is doing something Honda did with its small cars. They are getting young guys excited about them. These bikes are a phenomenon. Not only are they super light and easy to ride, they are easy to modify and customize like the old Civics. Suron riders now meet up in major cities and go on group rides popping wheelies and doing tricks. These rides are a thing now and there's a huge community building around this product. Suron even started its own race series. And when these guys grow up, do you think they'll have the same prejudice about Chinese products that the older generations do? They'll have no problem buying a reasonably priced Chinese bike. Another way these companies can gain market share is by GASP, offering consumers what they want. For years now, adventure riders have been begging for smaller, more off-road worthy motorcycles only to be presented with ever larger, heavier and more expensive battleships mostly designed to be good sports tours for the long haul. Yes, my own Tenere 700 was an attempt at a lighter bike, but it's still pretty big. Meanwhile, Kove was busy rolling out a literal Dakar race bike in the 450 rally and now CF Moto is coming out with a twin cylinder 450 Ibex. Both companies beat even KTM to the punch with this type of bike as the Austrian company probably won't roll out its new and improved 390 adventure until later this year, possibly at EICMA in November. Meanwhile, the Ibex is going to start at 6,500 US dollars. It's still a bit heavy for a 450, but it's better than most companies had managed in this segment. Hopefully Kawasaki builds a new Versus around its 452cc engine from the Eliminator. As long as we're talking about giving customers what they want, I don't see many people liking the new liquid-cooled Harley Sportsters. Most riders seem to prefer the old evil-powered Sportsters, which were slow and clunky, I should know, I used to own one, 
but they looked and sounded like Harley's should. So what did Harley do? Discontinue them, of course. Well, here comes SWM motorcycles with their Chinese-built Stormbreaker, almost an exact mechanical clone of the Sportster. And it looks pretty decent. No, it doesn't have that quality Harley finish, but neither did the old-school Harleys in the 60s and 70s. I can totally see riders getting these and chopping and customizing them. Harley said that the old Sportsters couldn't pass Euro emissions, but somehow SWM got the Stormbreaker through. Maybe by choking it up, it reputedly has less power than a 1200 Sportster. But everyone who gets these bikes uncorks them anyways, so customers won't care if they're a bit wheezy out of the factory. Nothing a stage one won't fix. So again, a Chinese company gets it done when a western one does not. One positive out of all of this is that the Chinese invasion might force other manufacturers to respond with comparable models. How about a Honda CRF 450L Rally, or the aforementioned Kawasaki vs. 450? When the Japanese started building cars that Americans wanted, American brands were eventually forced to respond with their own smaller and more efficient models. So the Chinese should approach the Western market like the Japanese, Koreans and Indians, not the Russians. Focus on quality and image, not just a low price. But what about the morality of buying Chinese products? Some folks will never do it and that's fine, but to me boycotting a whole country doesn't make much sense for several reasons. One, pretty much everything we buy from Walmart or Amazon is already made in China. Two, the people in any given nation are not responsible for the nation's internal policies. Especially in non-democratic countries, the people may themselves be victims. I know this having been born in communist Poland. The majority of the people in the country did not support the communist regime, but when you can't vote for anyone else, this doesn't matter. Boycotting businesses owned by these people doesn't hurt the regime, it hurts the people, many of whom are victims themselves. From the video made on the founder of Kove, you can tell this guy is passionate about motorcycles and innovation. He looks like an enthusiast, a lot like the friends I dirt ride with. I'm not going to boycott his product because of the government that rules his country, a government he didn't vote for by the way. Governments do bad things, and that includes our current western governments. So the bottom line is, if the Chinese brands want a significant slice of the western market, they need to focus on reliability and provide consumers with the cool bikes we're asking for. Don't blindly chase the lowest price at the expense of quality. Do what the Japanese and Korean manufacturers did in the auto industry, and what the Japanese Big Four did in motorcycles. In fact, do what Royal Enfield is doing right now. But what do you think? Can the Chinese do it? Would you buy a CF Moto, Kove, or Suron? Please share your thoughts in the comments below. Ride safe, and may the spokes be with you.